Aloha, I'm your host, Winston Welch, and I'm delighted that you are joining us again today for the special edition of Out and About, where we explore a variety of topics, organizations, and events with the people who fuel them in our city, state, country, and world. As a disclaimer, any views or opinions expressed by me are strictly my own and not connected with any organization. Joining me in the studio today, I am delighted to have Charlene uh, Chun Lum and oh, Diane, uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> Chun Lum and Diane Fujimura of Save Ala Moana Beach Park Hui. Welcome to the show today, ladies. Thank, Thank you. Winston. Yeah, it's an honor to have you here and stepping up to uh, this, this uh, very uh, important, uh, I guess, happening that's, that's going on right now in our city. And I think for the people that are out there that may or may not know about it, um, can you tell us what, what's going on right now in Ala Moana Park? Well, as you know, the planning for the park has been going on for several years, close to four. And um, each time the mayor has introduced something, it's kind of changed a little. And we are concerned that the things that are now in the uh, DEIS, the in Environmental Impact Statement, are things that really we don't need in the park and just add to the cost and will change the culture of the park. So we've been opposed to that and trying to have meetings and petitions and what have you. Right. Okay, and so you started a hui? Yes. Save all in one bar beach park hui? Yes, we did. Okay, and how long has that been going on? Actually, <laughs> officially only this year, but um, we've been at it in different forms for previous years. Yeah, we were um, a larger group, but we have focused on Save All in one Beach Park Hui, and we have very clear demands that we're Okay, and you're, you're working with other groups as well Correct, yeah. on this issue um, because it's... You're, uh, it's larger than just us. Larger than just us, yeah. but you're sharing a lot of the same common concerns. Mm -hmm. Right. So some of the other players, you know, um, Outdoor Circle, um, Friends of Kiwalo, Malama Moana, um, and so there have been various people um, who've taken up our cause or who believe in the cause as well. Mm -hmm. And we just happen to be... The spokespersons for this, this uh, the five points especially. There are actually 21 proposed actions in the SDEIS, and there were five that we took a stand on saying that we don't think should be in the park. Okay, so uh, for the people that may not know, the mm -hmm. SDEIS stands for? It's actually the secondary, uh, the second version or supplementary version of the draft environmental impact statement. And the draft environmental impact statement is required because? Anytime that they're going to do something uh, to an area of that's of great concern, they need to usually run this, this make it open to the public to comment on what they think about the plans. So it went through an EISPN, so a preliminary notice, then it went through a draft EIS, and then they had to come up with a secondary follow-up to that. And you know, it's actually been more than 11 months since many of us commented to the first the EIS, and we still haven't gotten a comment back. And that's probably one of the main issues underlying all of this is a feeling of not being listened to, not being uh, exactly. uh, consulted or, or uh, even addressed. I mean, is that, is that fair to say that, that you feel like the... Yeah, because I think the public meeting started way back in 2015. Mm -hmm. So there's been a series of so-called public meetings. The comments have been the same. They've been consistently against certain uh, proposed actions for the master plan for Ala Moana Beach Park. And yeah, the bottom line is the mayor does not seem to be listening, mm -hmm. nor his city administrators, which is uh, Robert Croning and Michelle Nakota. Mm -hmm. So, so they're, they're supposed to actually present alternatives. A after people ask comments, what are some alternatives? And because we haven't gotten any responses back, there are no alternatives. But we have offered up alternatives, lots of people have, as to you know, what should be done in the park. Okay, and so you've, you've they've presented 21 things, which probably include pretty pedestrian things like upgrading the restrooms and repaving the, the roads and that sort of thing. But you're particularly taking umbrage with five, five main points. And what are those points? And then we'll follow them up in detail. Sure. First thing is the Mackay Shared Use Path. This is the area of Mackay near the beach where there's a grassy strip and then there's the cement. And it's been there for years and people like to put their tents up on the, that grassy strip. The second one is the one about dog parks, uh, adding dog parks. And that was, by the way, added in with a DEIS with no town hall meeting to explain why they added it in. Perpendicular parking on the Malka side is another because we think it's dangerous. The sand replenishment is 
you, because that was introduced with the SDES, and then of course the World Class Playground, which was alluded to very briefly in the EISPN one-liners and in the DEIS, but then in the uh, SDIS a little more description, but still not sufficient. And the process feels a bit rushed and chaotic and... Uh... And not fully transparent. Um, you know, the playground is a primary example that said build a playground. That's all it said from the first initial documents. And then like Char said, all of a sudden there's a paragraph describing more fully what this world-class children's playground is supposed to be with no public vetting. And I think that uh, some of the, the council resolutions going back to 1998 actually mm -hmm. lay out what can and cannot be put in mm -hmm. in these different types of parks, whether it's an active use park, a passive park, uh, or multi-use multi multi regional, park, regional right, parks, yeah. which is what Ala Moana would fall under. Yes. Okay, and so for folks that are interested in that, if uh, you can go back to uh, that resolution, which was 98-188-CD1, which is Correct. an interesting one that lays mm -hmm. out what sort of structures and what, what the intent of all of these city parks are, so that moving forward when we have issues, whether it's a dog park or whatever it is, a playground that, mm -hmm. that, that has already been covered, we've already sort of laid out groundwork so that special um, deals don't get made, I guess would be right. a good way to say that. Misuse. Okay, so in these five ones here, we've got some really easy to follow slides. So if we can get the first slide up here, then we'll talk about the Mackay Shared Use Path. Um, so this is a graphic that shows what Almoana Beach Park currently looks like, which okay. is beautiful. As you can see, the lawn is green. And okay, in the next slide um, is the, the area we were talking about, the Mackay Shared Use Path. There's actually an ordinance that prohibits removing the grassy strip or extending the cement, but still, it's in the SDEIS saying they want to do this Mackay side shared use path. So the problem, of course, as you can see already, their people are, can't cross the street without being endangered. Mm -hmm. Kupuna and Keiki. And so the shared use, shared use means not just pedestrians. Vehicles, like the motorized scooter, uh, bikes. Segways. Yeah. Segways. They can all, they're supposed to share yeah. the use of the path. So they were going to widen it and take out that little grassy area where people usually pitch tents on occasions like 4th of July. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's just packed with local people setting up their tents to enjoy the fireworks and everything. So what about the poor bike riders? What are they supposed to do, or the Segway riders? <laughs> well, there actually is a bike path in Almada Beach Park. It's on the other side. It's by the tennis courts. There's, mm -hmm. there's, and I think in Magic Island, there's this sort of area where you can be distinguished by painting on the bikes. And they, they probably roll it. Can roller skate there as well, yeah, or whatever yeah, yeah. it is, and it's clearly marked, but it's mm -hmm. not this one right up against the, uh, the ocean. Right. And I, I've actually been there and have had people zooming by so fast on a bike that if I had stepped out just inadvertently or waved my arm, either I would have gotten injured or the bicyclist or both of us. Yeah, right. And if I were a you know, s slower moving person or a senior, I could imagine that there's been some pretty bad collisions. You know, there's a point about that because initially they referred to that sidewalk area as a promenade. There was no mention of it being a shared use path. But then all of a sudden, through the EIS process, it's been defined as a shared use path now. The interesting thing about that is it is because when it was called a promenade, um, our group and others protested about that use. And the city council actually put a, uh, a hold prohibiting them use any of the funds that were in the budget to build that promenade or take away Mackay Side Parking. So the city council has been listening to you? The previous city council, and now we hope this new one will too. Okay. And Tommy Waters did support this new resolution, so hopefully. So there may be some pressure left to bear that says we'll either hold the funds or, or prohibit right. certain the things. the city council can do that. Okay, uh, the next one is uh, no next dog slide. parks. Right. Uh, so, I, you know, those of us that have dogs, of course, we're thinking, oh, where are we going to take our dogs? But uh, and I can understand, like, oh, there was an area that was considered maybe a little unused uh, as uh, the entrance on the uh, Eva side, but that's a relative term, isn't it? And maybe that's actually quite used, but uh, people were saying, well, let's put this off as a little separate area for the dog park, which seems like a reasonable thing until you look at the, the plan for, that's, that's in resolution uh, 98, uh, 188 CD1, which has been in effect for 20 years now, that says we're, we're not balkanizing the parks with permanent structures anymore. So in this case, maybe there's another great location for it right down the street. 
Well, and you know, there was recently a study that was done. Carol Fukunaga worked with um, Michelle Nicota, and they did a study to figure out what was the best, what were the specifications for a good dog park. One of the things they found was that you shouldn't, it needs about half an acre at least, mm -hmm. and it shouldn't be near a lot of traffic or people. So I'll oh, want a beach park, you know, is full of people and cars coming in and out. Even if they're not staying, they're traversing through the park. Yeah. Buses are traversing through the park. So it's really not a good place to build it. Plus, um, you're right. There are people I know when they found out where that park was going to be, they said, that's where I picnic all the time with my family. Yeah. And so, um, and the, the, more, the biggest concern we have is that when, if dogs are taken to, because you can't keep them just in that park. You're there, you're at the beach. Oh, let's go down to the beach. Once they get down to the beach and they, the dogs do wherever they do, um, there's actually uh, studies that show that that dog do in the, will cause worms to come out. They could infect people. And there are lots of people who have uh, illnesses from what's in the sand from the dogs. So. And it's, you know, it's interesting because I did submit testimony on this. And I initially had said, yeah, I, th I think that's okay. But then after this other stuff has come up and said, not only those issues of we need a bigger space, actually, um, in a non-trafficked area. But also that the regulations for the parks say, if we do this, then we pretty much have to start allowing everything everywhere. And, um, you know, it's, it's well, we got the dog park. Why can't we have this or that or the other? Like, right. I think one uh, example of this, which I think, because when I was reading 98, uh, 188, it seems like the sand beach volleyball was sort of exempted because it is a special sand area. It's not volleyball. If it were volleyball, it would be different, but sand volleyball, it was sort of put in there, but without a lot of public discussion. Um, yeah. But let's let that one slide for right now. But so this, and I can understand also if you're playing on the beach, you probably want to have as pristine a beach as possible as well. Right. And I can see other things where dogs might get into fights on the beach and that sort of thing. So uh, mm -hmm. you don't want to have your cakeys around that. Um, next so slide. next slide we got is perpendicular parking. What's wrong with this? Well, to us, it's kind of a no-brainer. Um, they've installed perpendicular parking stalls, you know, around the city already, Manoa Marketplace, converted from slanted stalls to perpendicular. It's very difficult for anybody to back out, especially into traffic, which is along Alamona Beach Park Drive. Um, your sight is limited. Um, you know, it's going to stall traffic. It's two-way traffic. So more so people are unloading their beach gear, their surfboards, their bikes, whatever. And it's just not um, an appropriate parking um, structure to have in Alamona Beach Park. You know, the, the thing about doing perpendicular parking as well is they're going to have to remove grass from the, that area because you can't back out otherwise. So they're, so they're going to have to take out more grass and trees. And... There, there is also some infrastructure built in there for lights and plumbing, et cetera. So that's going to all have to be taken out to do this. Now, when they take it out, that whole, they have to account for the fact that a lot of people who go to the beach have huge vehicles, trucks, or they carry coolers and mm -hmm. other things. You try to open those doors in a, par in a parallel parking space, a perpendicular parking space like that, there's probably going to be a lot of dents on people's cars from people trying to open their door to get to their things because... The spaces aren't going to be huge. They're trying to increase the parking by doing this. So it's, it's an unsafe thing, first of all. And then secondly, it does remove some of the trees and put more cement, more global warming. And then it is uh, dangerous not only for people, but for cars, <laughs> by other people's cars. It's interesting. I see you have here uh, that we should use, um, well, that they, I think the city just repaved the, mm -hmm. the, the with. They're uh, going to repave. Yeah. They're going to repave and with impervious. Them asphalt rather than something that could absorb the water yeah. and go straight down, right. which I think should be a basic city policy, mm -hmm. period, private, public development, that if you're paving a structure, you need to have the, something that can absorb the water. It just makes sense rather than runoff, especially so close to the ocean. Yeah. And the interesting thing is, you know, Mayor Fossey just, not for us, Mayor Fossey, Caldwell, <laughs> Caldwell just said that they're going to do this uh, road repaving. So we checked, is, does that mean they're going to do the perpendicular parking? And they said, no, they're not. But in the future, they might. So this is more of if they do that. It's like okay, you lay down that cement and there, or that asphalt, and then, okay, you're going to dig it all up again to lay down the perpendicular parking. So it's just inefficient use of our, our tax dollars. So we're, we're going to have to take a break here, but I, I see that 
You know, there's a lot of issues going on right now, whether it's uh, this, whether it's Alawai, uh Watershed, Top Golf over right. at uh, Malawana mm -hmm. uh, right. uh, Golf Save course. our Sherwoods. If it's Save our Sherwood Forest, um, helicopters flying over the city, uh, mm -hmm. uh, any yeah. number of issues that we've got here that are very serious issues, uh, but you know, our train being built in a, in a very soon to be floodplain. Um, mm -hmm. We've got a lot of issues going on here. A few years ago, we had Cavallo uh, Basin issue, and we saw the community rising up and saying, "No, we are not doing mm -hmm. high rises over there." Is this a continuation of this, or is this is this bigger? Is this is is it was that a precursor to this? Or the really interesting thing about that process was it was a community-based process. They actually had people come, and they had several meetings, and they took votes on the different areas, and they knew what was going along all the way, and they had iterations of, "Okay, how about this? How about that?" This process is very secretive. You know, you send your comments in. We don't know who else sent comments in unless we ask them, hey, could you send us your comments? And otherwise, we don't know what other alternatives people are, are suggesting. And many of them have really great suggestions, but we don't get to see it. And we have to trust that the city is going to send us a complete picture of what everybody sent and complete answers that address those questions. Because the first EISPN, where we sent questions in, not all of our questions were answered. They had standardized letters. And the letter, if this, this is close enough to yours, OK, we're going to send you that. And that doesn't answer the question we may have asked. So. And I think in this era, especially when we've had some issues of trust, and mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't matter where, where it is, but certainly uh, at our local, uh, most local level of government, we want to have transparent, open, uh, good yes. communication back and forth so that right. We're the people, and we're the ones that need to be served as best as we can. And of course, our, you know, our civil servants are hardworking. We have to think we, that, that they have our best interests at heart. And but we want them. We want our our concerns to be listened to. So uh, we got a couple more important points, and then we'll get to those topics as okay. well. As far as as that after our break, but uh, right now we are going to take a little break. I'm Winston Welch. This is out and about on the Think Tech Live Streaming Network series. We're with Charlene Chun Lum. Chun, uh, no, no, sorry, Chun, Chun Lum. Chun, <laughs> like Chun. Okay, Chun Lum and Diane Fujimura of Save Alamwana Beach Park, Hui. We'll be back in a moment, so stay tuned for more of the story. Aloha, I'm Melly James, host of Let's Mana Up. Tuesdays, every other Tuesday, from 11 to 11.30. This show is meant to dive into stories of local product entrepreneurs and how they're growing their companies from right here in Hawaii. I'm so thrilled to have our show kicked off. And so please join us on Tuesdays at 11 o'clock as we talk to local entrepreneurs and hear their stories. Aloha, my name is Mark Schlav. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea program. My program airs every other Monday at one o'clock on Think Tech Hawaii. Most of my programs deal with my own life and law experience. Recently, I interviewed Alex Jempel who I have known for over 30 years, about his voyage across the sea as a lawyer from Tokyo to Hawaii. Those are the type of stories that I like to bring and like to talk about, human stories about law and life. Aloha. To come down to testify. Oh, it's actually August, August 7th. 7th. Okay, well, we are back and we're live because sometimes on live TV, you're still talking to your guests when the TV comes <laughs> on. And I have some wonderful guests here. I'm Winston Welch. This is Out and About on the Think Tech Live Streaming Network series, talking with Charlene Chun Lum and Diane Fujimura of Save Ala Moana Beach Park Hui. Uh, this is one Hui of, of many that, that has come here, of Malama Moana and uh, Outdoor Circle and... Uh, um, Kivalos, 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 Friends of Kivalos. And yeah. Friends of Kivalos and other uh, community groups. Your neighborhood board is mm -hmm. interested as well. Um, you've had uh, Tommy Waters and probably... Is it, uh, Strong Carol, support from uh, Ann Kobayashi. And Ann Kobayashi, probably maybe Carol Fukunaga's mm -hmm. um, right. Right. weighed in on it. Support. So um, we were just going over the, the five main actions that you proposed. We looked at the Makai Shared Use Path, uh, the dog park at Kivalo Entrance, um, Perpendicular parking, and then w the next one was sand replenishment, which was a, a newer one that's been. Right. Uh, is it fairly new thrown on there, or was that? Mm. They discussed doing yeah. it back in the DEIS, but then the SDEIS introduces a new site. Okay. And the site they're introducing is right outside of Kiwalo, I mean, right outside of these very popular surf spots, Baby Haleiwa concessions, and um, so okay. courts, right? And the reason 
Actually, that's the, the next slide, I guess. So, I think it's... Oh, next. yeah, we have the next slide. That's... Yes, so the sand nourishment um, ha may have direct and indirect impacts on the uh, ecosystem because what they're talking about is, number one, getting the sand from outside. And <clears throat> there are, there's no guarantee that once they disturb those spots, they won't actually affect the way the surf runs. But the other thing, um, and the next slide, if you take a look at that, they talk about using the sand to go over and cover the rubble on the beach, Amazing. because I think they kind of want it to be look like Ipanema or something like that. But um, today, just today, I was out there, and there's this young boy fishing in the, quote, rubble, because that's where the fish are. Right. There's, you know, there's a lot of baby fish plus other fish that live there. So it's not rubble. It's natural, and it's the ecosystem where the fish can be there growing before they go out and be the big fish out, out past the reef. You know, um, I think a lot of people um, complain because it's rocky, but they don't understand that there are fish habitats that are involved in that rocky area. And the thing about the sand replenishment is that they haven't tested the source of what, where the sand is going to come to replenish what they want to do. And where is that? Is that our next slide? So if you, there's a couple slides, I think. Yeah. So this is actually showing the king tides and sea level rise. By the way, the, according to Sea Engineering, they would put the sand all the way up to where the wall is. Oh, to really? The, top yeah. of the, where the wall is. So our question is, well, when there's sea level rise or king tides, that's going to push all that sand onto the Right, onto this road. The, the yeah. promenade. And the and, road is yes, and then there's <laughs> been discussion about the last time that happened with a big storm, there were trucks that came in, took the sand off the road, and took it somewhere else. So that's a lot of money to be spending to put sand on that area. It's going to be taken away. And from this slide, you can see uh -oh. um, the sea level rise is estimated. So they started with three feet. 3.2, but then they said maybe they estimated wrong, so it's more like six feet. So all of all Moana will be underwater, unfortunately, and that's one of those questions that Tommy Waters brought up about, you know, why are you doing all these big improvements to the park when it may be you're underwater. not, yeah, it might be underwater, and what are you doing to take care of that problem? So obviously there's, that wall needs to be taller if they're going to put the sand <laughs> right up to it, or something's got right, to go on there. Right. Okay, and, and the source of the sand is coming Next from the slide. next slide, which right. I think is also very concerning mm -hmm. given uh, that they're dredging all the White Canal right now and right. that it's one of the most polluted waterways in the world, it or in the, the country anyway. At a meeting and they said, oh, that, that's not polluted. I'm like, oh, uh, I don't <laughs> know which universe you're from. But anyway, so when they do, um, they said these models from um, University of Hawaii have shown that there's this, tu this um, turbidity plume yes. that comes out of the Alawai and flows into the area where the proposed sand um, donor site is. And question is, as it drops those pollutants from Alawai into the sand, and they pick up the sand from that area, they may be bringing pollutants to the beach and the turbidity on the beach. Once they, and they've said, actually I heard Michelle Nakota say, yes, there'll be turbidity in the water, but it's kind of like washing rice. Eventually it'll get clear. <laughs> you know, uh, it'll take a long time before it'll get clear, because you're not washing rice down the sink. You're, you're talking about the same area that you have to deal with that the water's coming in and out and of. You can see that, that, that uh, you know, I have to, they, they, when they dredge, when they're dredging the, the canal right now, and they have to take it to an EPA super fun, it's not a super fun flight, it's a dump site 10 miles offshore or 10 right. kilometers offshore and Three dump miles, there. Is that yeah. what it is? It's, it, it's not far enough. Yeah, uh, yeah but p pumping that up on the beach seems kind of a... Uh, you know, um, Sea Engineering, which the city hired to do the study for the environmental impact statement process, we had a meeting with them earlier mm -hmm. this year in June, and they did state that the sand has not been tested for contaminants. Mm. But they also said it can easily be done. And, you know, that's one of the things why there at least has to be a third draft environmental impact statement. Okay, so you're, that. and that was one thing I wanted to get to there. You're focusing now, there's a city council resolution. Is it city council or is it a, a city council? A city council on uh, August 7th. August 7th, it'll be heard by the full council. By the full council in right. Kapolei. Yes. Kapolei, Kapolei. Kapolei. So you got to drive out there yeah. um, or submit your comments online right. by going to honolulu.gov and following the instructions there. Um, uh, there's one other big, so uh, and all of these things that people should weigh and they should be informed one way or another, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's wonderful that we do have a say, but we want to know what, what are you saying? What are these other great ideas that other people may or may not have? Last one we got here is the one-acre world-class playground. Um, what 
What's the problem with the World Class Playground? <laughs> the problem, okay, from the preparation notice of the EIS, it was build a playground. That's all it said. Yeah. And then uh, from the draft environmental impact statement to the second draft em environmental impact statement, it still had play, uh, build a playground, but then this paragraph describing this rendering that you're seeing um, appeared in the second draft EIS. Um, it's supposed to be some private uh, donations from Pa'ani Kako. Um, it's interesting if you look behind Pa'ani Kako, who's a member of that supposed 501c3 organization. It's not yet registered with the IRS as a 501c3. Um, it is registered with the state as a charitable organization, but they only organized in this January 2019. When they were talking about being an IRS 501c3 way back in 2017, I believe, and before that. So when Mayor Caldwell first mentioned this world-class children's playground, they had already been meeting together. Mm -hmm. And so to us, this so-called world-class children's playground exemplifies everything that's wrong with the mayor, the city administration, and how he's driving this um, playground to become a reality. And so it, it's a, maybe a lack of transparency, accountability, public yeah. input is, is the, the main thing there. But I think no one's against the idea of having a, a no. wonderful playground or children, actually throughout the entire right. islands, right. just not in this location, right. because this park has a special uh, history and, right. uh, and, a, and a requirement that it preserve open spaces in our precious uh, urban area. Right, as, as you, you know that um, Almana Park got a historic registration, you know, was recognized in 1988, and they talk about these open green spaces. And then you mentioned Resolution 98-188 CD1, which says, you need to preserve these green open spaces or these open spaces for larger groups and larger organizations. But this playground, this one acre playground, is basically going to take up a huge portion of the open green space. And remove some trees and in the process. And remove the trees. And, and a lot of unanswered questions. They, they will cause, now it's interesting because when they did put it into the SDEIS, they only put it in the front introduction. They, they did, said nothing more about how this is going to impact sewers, how it's going to impact uh, climate change, how it's going to impact, you know, anything else. That's all the same as it was in the DEIS. So it's kind of a band-aid put together the SDEIS just to add this playground and the sand replenishment and to address OHA's um, lack of cultural impact. That OHA assessment. said there's a lack of cultural impacts. It, the uh, first study was not a cultural impact assessment. It was just that this is some cultural things about it. And so they were supposed to go and talk to all the people who and they really only talk to the people who submitted testimony versus everybody who's other practitioners who know what the park has been used for. But when they got that study, it's hidden in the SDEIS towards, it's hidden in the appendices. And it doesn't really reflect it because they got it. Okay, they checked off the box, but they haven't made any changes based on what they got. So that's, that's an issue we have about a lot of these studies are just insufficient. The one about the sand was like, well, the one about saying there's no fish was a one-day study during the day, and it's like fish are seasonal, fish are come out at night, and they said they saw nothing because water was, was, you know, cloudy. So it could be said, so for the world-class playground, for example, there's, if it's for 250 to 500 kids, lots of, and especially for special needs kids, you've got to have a lot more handicapped parking spaces right. available in a park that's already pretty tight. We have other alternatives that you guys have, have voiced and that is even in the, the plans, like put it in Kakaku next to the Children's mm -hmm. Discovery mm -hmm. Center, also a wonderful place for right. a nice big dog park over right. there. Plenty of parking, right. activating that space, reclaiming it to the city. There's a lot of different things, as you mentioned, turbidity. So there's a lot of turbidity right now. Uh, we're looking for some answers, some transparency, some clarity, uh, clarity some accountability to um, to all of us. And so I think that your group is, is part of the answer, Save Alamana Beach Park. If people want to know more information, where can they go? Um, they, can, they can actually write to Save Alamana Beach Park. Hui. We have, a, I think, this graphic up there shows you where you can send your email to, or they okay. can text that phone number, which happens to be mine, but you can text that phone number and we will get back to you and provide you um, information. But we have been trying to encourage more people to voice their opinion because really the government or People, we're, we just got involved. We're average citizens. We're not, you know. Okay. But we decided at some point that we need to speak up because otherwise, um, 
just being run over, our, uh, like you said, with the rail, with all these other things. Things are happening, and initially when we started, people said, oh, you know, it's really good that you're doing this, but you know, you can't stop City Hall, or you can't do this, it's a done deal. But we've actually made some inroads, and we think the more people stand up and say, um, we're not taking this. And really, for the other, there's other people, other council members who have other districts where the playgrounds are terrible. I mean, the parks are terrible. They're not open, the bathrooms are. So let's focus yeah. on some of these other yeah. issues. And you know, it's, it's, I applaud you both for stepping up to this cause, specifically for voicing your concerns, for sharing this with other people, and for being role models for a lot of the other issues that we have in our society. It's we live in complicated times. We need people just like you, and unfortunately, we are out of time today. So <laughs> as I said, we, the time will go very fast. Can you come back again and give us an update and some other things? Um, I, would, I would love that, and, uh, and we'll hear. Maybe we'll get some more resolution out of this in a, in a, in a way that's favorable to you all. Um, request. So unfortunately, we are out of time. We've had some excellent examples of, of democracy in action of civic leaders who've stepped up to the plate. I'm Winston Welch. This is Out and About on the Think Tech streaming live network series. We've been talking with Charlene Chan Lum and Diane Fujimura of the Save Alamwana Beach Park Hui. Get involved and call the city if you care. Go out to Kapolei Hale on August 7th or to submit written testimony. Thanks for tuning in and we welcome your feedback. Thanks to our uh, broadcast engineer, Robert McLean, our floor manager, uh, usually Eric uh, Kalander, but today it was Mark Ito, and to Jay Fidel, our executive producer, and also Miss Ikeda, who is helping Robert in the studio. We'll see you every other Monday here at 3 p.m. on Think Tech Out and About. Aloha, everyone.